Welcome back and welcome to for people that are just joining for this second uh, episode of uh, of today's webinars. We've just finished the first one, uh, which was on the topic of product service innovation. Um, and uh, the video of that will be uploaded tonight. So in case you couldn't join for the first session, you can just uh, go watch it tonight. And uh, this one will be recorded as well. Today's second topic here uh, deals with manufacturing and value chains. Uh, we will present its importance in terms of circular readiness and also provide some industry statistics along the way. After 15 minutes of presentation, we will start the Q&A session. So please add your questions when they pop up and you do that in the Q&A function here in Zoom. Um, the chat is open. You can share any relevant info, just not the questions for us because we won't be looking so much on that during the Q&A session. This topic will be presented by Associate Professor Daniela Picasso here from DTU. Daniela has a background in environmental and industrial engineering, and she has led numerous research projects with a focus on circular value chains, like the circuit project, which is another uh, related project that we do in our team. Um, in that she mapped hundreds of different circular interventions up and downstream in the value chain. In fact, she actually supervised me when I wrote my thesis on circular value chains for municipal uh, plastic waste. So thank you for that, Daniela. Daniela will be supported by Tim McAloon, who is the lead of the MATCH project. And he is a professor here at D2 Mechanical Engineering. Uh, his research covers product service systems, as we just learned before, sustainability and circular economy. Daniela, the stage is yours. Thanks a lot, Lesse. So let's talk now about manufacturing and value chain. And I'd like to start by uh, providing a motivation for why are we talking about manufacturing when we uh, think about circular economy implementation. And here's an interesting fact. So by 2050, in a few years from now, production systems will consume about 140 billion tons per year of minerals, ores, fuels, and biomass. This is about three times the current consumption. And this is the scenario that will take place if we don't implement circular economy and we continue in a linear economy. And as you might expect, uh, we don't have enough earth to be able to do that. Resource availability is already an issue in a number of different sectors. Um, it is really a challenge for companies that need to use those materials in their products. And they either don't have access to them because they don't really exist anymore, or they are extremely expensive, making that not really uh, feasible to put that in their products anymore. And then circular economy, of course, comes as a uh, approach, an opportunity to take all of the materials that we are using today in our products and take them back and recycle them and put them back in the system so that we can keep our consumption uh, patterns at a much more uh, sustainable way. Um, as we, we usually say, the main goal of circular economy is to decouple value creation from resource consumption. And to make that possible, we need to bring circularity into our manufacturing systems. And there are many different ways that we can do that. We can think about what are the different uh, supplies or inputs that we are using in our manufacturing processes. And we can try to rethink to more circular solutions, such as, for instance, using more biodegradable or renewable uh, materials looking more into the biological cycle of a circular economy. We can also uh, consider recovering resources and used materials. For instance, using ocean plastics as a raw material for our new products. And we can see many different companies doing so um, today. And uh, Adidas is a, a good example of that as well. Another uh, approach that we can take is to use more recycled materials um, into our production systems to also enhance the demand 
for those products uh, so that we can actually recycle more at a more competitive rate than we do today. For some materials, we already have today a very high circularity index, such as metals or steel, for instance. It is one of the most recycled materials in the world today. But there is a lot of potential for many other materials. And what's also important here is to use recyclable materials in our productions so that when those products come into an end of life phase, we can actually recycle them and bring them back into the loop. So all of those three areas focusing on circular supplies. Other strategies that we can look at in our manufacturing processes has to do with um, acquiring supplies as a service. So for example, chemical leasing, it's a very interesting approach here where manufacturing companies in need of chemicals, they don't buy them anymore. They buy the function that they provide uh, from their suppliers and the suppliers are responsible for having the most efficient and effective way of using those chemicals to deliver the results that you expect to deliver. It's a really nice way of uh, being much more effective than we are today. And then the final strategy here, and this one has been there for quite many years now, is the industrial symbiosis system, where the overall idea here is to use byproducts from other companies that are usually close by as uh, raw materials in your production. And by doing that, you ensure closed loops in the system uh, of companies that are around you. Many different examples of approaches that can ensure a higher uh, circularity in the manufacturing process. But this dimension is also about value chain. And then the next question is, why value chain? And this uh, is a very nice statement from the World Economic Forum, where they say that only when all actors along the value chain find profitable ways to take resource scarcity into account. And only if they share both costs and benefits. So here we have responsibilities uh, and win-win situation at the same time. Only when that happens, we'll be able to unlock all of the potential with circular economy. There is no one single company that can make the transition to circular economy alone. And it's extremely important to engage in the value chain to find the right partners and to build win-win collaborations. And here again, some examples on how we can do it. So the first one is to create value in a collaboration uh, approach with your value chain. So the idea here, for instance, would be to establish collaborations across the value chain to enable the life extension of products. So for instance, um, if you are a manufacturer of a machinery and you sell that all over the world, but you don't have the service capacity uh, to provide support during the use phase, then establishing partnerships for maintenance, repair, upgrade, installation, transportation, and logistics is a very nice strategy um, to do. And we see many companies going that way in order to scale up their circular economy initiatives. Another way of doing that would be to also make partnerships to deal with the end of life treatment of products and materials. So here it's all about making partnerships with waste management companies and scrap dealers, uh, for example, that will ensure that at the point in time that your product reaches end of life, then the materials will be recycled, recovered, and potentially back to you so that you can use as a raw material as well. The next area has to do with uh, establishing those partnerships to look into new digital services uh, to enable new circular business models. We would say that one of the biggest reasons why we can see this really big boom of sharing systems and product service systems today is because they are enabled by digital technologies. But not all companies have the capabilities to do it by themselves and establishing partnerships is therefore extremely important here. 
Another way of doing that is to look into partnerships for financial uh, solutions for partners, which again, extremely relevant in a product service system uh, context. And then also looking to partnerships uh, to develop the recycling infrastructure together. It might be that in some uh, countries, regions and so forth, there's no infrastructure for recycling, but several different companies can join forces and can establish that um, in, in collaboration. And that's actually the case for the bottle return system here in Denmark where companies uh, organize themselves and develop a not-for-profit organization that would handle all of the take back uh, of those products. And then finally, what we can also do is to look into uh, developing the infrastructure for take back, so collection, and also for remanufacturing, refurbishment, and so forth. And what we see here, quite interesting, is that we have collaborations among companies that are from very different sectors, but we also see collaborations among companies that are actually competitors in the same industry, and they can actually reach win-win benefits, sharing the costs at the same time. Now we know why it is important, and this is also the reasons why we do have manufacturing and value chain as one of the eight dimensions in the readiness assessment uh, in match. And, uh, we basically ask companies when assessing the readiness here four main questions. The first one is to what extent the companies are establishing new partnerships in the value chain to enable a circular business. And this could be of many different types as we just discussed before. We also look into how much the companies are actually influencing their suppliers so that they can encourage circular initiatives in their supply chain. That's also extremely important so that you create the demand and the need for uh, all the companies to think in the same way and to find new and innovative solutions. The next one has to do with using recycled, renewable, biodegradable materials in their manufacturing processes so that they uh, have more circular uh, manufacturing, they have more circular products, and they also have more circular uh, raw materials. And then finally, the last one is looking to industrial symbiosis and to what extent companies are entering um, into uh, those initiatives. Farming areas should support us in measuring how ready companies are. Now, Tim, we are really curious to hear what the data says to us and how companies are actually doing in relation to those four different areas. Yeah, so let's have a quick look at that, uh, Daniela. So what we have here is our dashboard for manufacturing and value chain. And the first thing to notice, if those of you have been watching the other uh, webinars so far, is that um, this is out of a score of uh, possible 20 because there were uh, four questions in this dimension. This is actually the dimension where we see the highest overall readiness. So with uh, 9.37 out of 20, it's almost half of the companies, uh, uh, sorry, half the companies that are, are almost at half the, the readiness potential uh, in this uh, system here. We can see that there's a very even spread between B2B, B2C and B2G uh, uh, markets. The companies that are, uh, which are um, supplying to these different markets. And this changes depending on the, the dimension. In the overall uh, view, we can see that food and beverage are the, uh, the most ready. And then the building materials uh, suppliers next with uh, some margin down to the others. And then metal and metal products and uh, pharmaceutical uh, preparations and instruments. This is also devices uh, being on the start of their journey here. Let's have a look at some of the, uh, the different aspects here uh, very briefly now. First of all, in terms of new partnerships, here we can see uh, quite a, a spread in fact, um, and it's the, uh, the, the second highest uh, readiness of the four aspects in this dimension. But uh, we see a lot of companies that are actually piloting their initiatives. And here interesting to see is that any companies which are uh, working within B2G, they disappear um, when you go to piloting initiatives, when you go to uh, planning up and scaling initiatives or actually scaling up or have scaled up initiatives here. So this is quite interesting to, to observe. 
uh, companies within the, in the B2G area, they're in the emerging part here. So we can see that companies with that have relationships with uh, municipalities and regions and, and uh, counties and so forth um, are starting now. So that's a, maybe a signal that there's a lot of activity going on, uh, but the redness is quite low uh, in, in that uh, type of a, a sector there. And this is about partnerships across the value chain to enable circular business. Maybe another notable thing here is, is uh, the industrial symbiosis. Daniela just mentioned that this has um, been around for quite some time now. Here in Denmark, we have the Kalambor example, which is a town in the, uh, the west of the, uh, the island of Sealand, which was the first uh, industrial symbiosis example. Uh, but this is, seems to be maybe obviously uh, one of the areas where there is at least uh, a lower amount of redness may be obvious because it, it needs lots of different agreements between different stakeholders in order to see how can we use one party, use another party's uh, waste or by, waste materials or byproducts as their raw materials. So that's uh, where the, the redness is lower, but the intention is high. Um, and then an area here uh, for supply chain, relatively uh, evenly spread, but quite a lot that have not started to look in their supply chain now. Uh, small uh, products, uh, safety, sports equipment, toys and so forth have a, uh, the, the highest of the rednesses here, uh, but then down to machinery and motor vehicles, even furniture um, is uh, relatively uh, on the start of that journey. Finally, before I hand it back to Daniela, if we look at the materials in manufacturing, this is the, the highest uh, redness area of the four aspects in this dimension. And here we can see that there's a lot of uh, activity in the scaling up of uh, initiatives where we see uh, a relatively even spread between the B2B, B2C and, and the B2G companies, and also between the size of the companies, interesting, interestingly. And here we see uh, the chemistry, plastics and refined materials uh, together with food and beverage and building materials um, providers and manufacturers being at the, the, the highest readiness areas here. So I think that's what we have time for in the uh, in this brief look into the uh, into the stats. Daniela, back over to you. Thanks a lot, Tim. And I think that's something that it's really interesting to note is that manufacturing and value chain they can be combined at the same time. Just coming back to the example that Tim presented in the webinar before the green fiber bottle with Cosberg, where they are developing a new bottle uh, that is made out of paper but at the same time can be uh, recycled, but also biodegraded in case it ends up in nature. And in order to be able to bring that product to market, they had to have a very strong innovation into their manufacturing processes by using a completely different uh, raw material as an entrance point, first of all, but also by reinventing uh, the way that you can process that material in order to create the 3D shapes that we need for the bottles. But at the same time, they also had to reinvent the entire value chain, the partners they were collaborating with for acquiring the raw materials, the machines they were using, and also the way that they were um, providing the products to the supermarkets, to the customers, and also taking them back in the end of life. So it's a really good example of how manufacturing and value chain comes together to enable uh, circularity by bringing new product innovations in the market. Great, so that was our main overview for um, this dimension. Now, what we want to do is to hear Lesse, if you have any questions uh, from the audience. Yeah, and you're actually partly just answering some of them. Uh, first, I have some questions regarding the, the really cool cards you presented in your presentation, Daniela. Mm -hmm. uh, for you, those of you interested, I pasted the link for those because they are available for free. But can you just shortly mention what they are and, and how they work? Yeah, they are extremely interesting uh, cards to support the ideation of new business models for circular economy, looking both in the upstream, those are the green cards that I didn't show today, but also the uh, upstream areas that are the blue cards focused on value chain uh, innovation and manufacturing. They were developed in the context of a Nordic project uh, by Marina Pieroni during her PhD. 
uh, where she had the chance to look into more than 200 different cases uh, for circular economy implementation. And she took out the best examples to support new insights and ideation for circularity. So if you have the interest in exploring what are the opportunities for your company, we would definitely recommend you to have a look into that and many other tools that we also have in the Match platform that will really help you to move from where you are today to a higher readiness on circular economy. Thank you. And uh, Tim, if you can uh, come back online, uh, I have a, a really interesting comment here from uh, Janaida. And uh, she uh, notes that uh, 2021 is the year where we're actually going to deliver uh, and act on the uh, sustainable development goals by the UN. How does MATCH relate uh, and support this uh, transition? Great question. I think it's Janaina. Uh, so nice to uh, see you here, Janaina. Uh, thanks for the question. Yeah, so the way we see circular economy uh, connecting to the sustainable development goals is that there is a number of the sustainable development goals which are exactly about uh, understanding how to, you could say, uh, look at the infrastructural uh, areas of the way in which we live in the built environment, in our um, developed societies and so forth. The most important uh, link between the um, Sustainable Development Goals and Circular Economy, and therefore the MATCH project, is uh, SDG 12. Um, I'm, I'm going to go and get it for you. I had it here. So SDG 12, which is, oh, it's in Danish, uh, which is Responsible uh, Consumption and Production. So this SDG uh, is about how do we actually decouple value creation from uh, the resource consumption. And I think that uh, one of the, the really important goals of uh, the SDGs um, is, is to, to, to do this. And one of the important goals of circular economy where it really interfaces is very closely here. But if I were to run over and get another cube over there, there's one about uh, the built environments and cities. Uh, that's also an important one. Uh, a, a lot of the examples that we've uh, we've seen and the companies we've been working with are in the uh, the uh, the construction industry, which has been pointed out many times as being an important area to focus on. Many uh, are within the uh, food and beverage industry, which is another uh, one about the way in which we uh, both feed the world, which is one part of uh, one of the SDGs, but also make sure that we stop food waste. It's estimated that about uh, a third of the, uh, the, the, uh, the food that we produce out of field and process is, is wasted. Um, and uh, a lot of that is underway before it even gets to the supermarket. And then after that, uh, the food waste that we have in our, our homes is, uh, is less so, but still important to, uh, to focus on. So I think that the, uh, the, the circular economy interface to the SDGs is mainly in, in the one I just grabbed uh, um, over there in SDG 12, but also in a number of the other ones. And what we do in the MATCH project, this has been focused on the manufacturing industry so far. We have plans to expand MATCH in all different uh, directions. But what we're reporting on here, and mostly what you're seeing in the, uh, the data and the statistics we're showing, is from manufacturing companies. Um, so that's basically around products uh, and heavy machinery and uh, uh, small devices and so forth, but anything that can be developed, manufactured and used, basically. Um, having said that, we have had companies in from the building industry, from uh, cities and from even actually even agriculture. If you watch the website over the next two days or so, you'll see a new case coming there from, from the agriculture where we actually went to a farm to see how, how can farms be more circular in the way in which they operate. So it was a longer answer to a, to a short question, but uh, we see the match interfacing quite nicely with some key SDGs uh, there. Thank you. Daniela, just before the um, question round, you mentioned implementing manufacturing and value chain at the same time. Related to that, we have a question whether we have worked with the role of the designer um, because as noted here, the, the best waste is never created in the first place. Yeah, definitely. Uh, circular economy really uh, needs systemic uh, considerations in order to be able to bring all of the benefits that we expect from it and to be more sustainable. And I would say that only when we manage to combine 
the design of new products and solutions with new business models, new manufacturing and production processes, um, new value chains, at uh, a time that we managed to keep those products by providing services as long as possible in the market, and that we take them back when it's not possible to do so anymore. It's when we really reach and unlock the entire circular economy potential. That's also the reason why we have those eight key dimensions in the circular economy readiness assessment that wouldn't really make sense to focus only at one or a couple of them. In order to be able, we need to think that from the very beginning to avoid uh, the waste to happen, as you, as you were mentioning. And I'd say that it's also extremely important always to keep in mind that our youth made goal is to decouple value creation from resource consumption, aiming at a higher sustainability performance. And this should be the guiding direction for everybody working uh, in the field. Thank you. And I think the, the last question here will, will go to you, Tim, because uh, as noted by, by Martin, um, there are lots of uh, services that are actually circular without us really thinking them as being circular. That could be uh, the shipping industry or renting of forklifts, which has been status quo for a long time. When these companies take our survey in the match pl platform, are they then considered to be a circular business or how does that work? Yeah, thanks for the question, Martin. So important to mention is we're not judging companies on how circular they are. Um, we're basically helping companies to do a self-assessment on how ready they are themselves for circularity. So we're not uh, doing this. This should not be seen as a, in any way an audit as to, to what level of circularity they're at. Many companies may be doing uh, really great pilot projects and really great areas of, of focus within their organization but uh, not uh, seeing a readiness in another dimension. So that's basically what the match project has been trying to, to measure. But when you're saying that now, Martin, it's an important point that uh, does, can we call ourselves circular just because we do this and that? So if we have a sharing system or if we have a lease, if we've been leasing our products for many years or doing some form of after sales service on our machinery for the last two decades, are we then circular? No, not automatically. We have here a bunch of ingredients uh, which uh, from each company uh, can contribute to circularity. And as I mentioned yesterday, actually, we see a uh, circular economy as one means to sustainability. Um, and if you don't see circular economy as a means to sustainability, then there's no point in, in measuring whether you're circular or not, because you can do things which are circular and are actually unsustainable. Uh, but you can see you could basically circularity and circular economy initiatives as being a vehicle to sustainability. And you can use that vehicle to, to, uh, to get into the direction, but you need to have the direction. So I think it's a really important point, uh, Martin, that if you find yourself in an example uh, that we mentioned either on the match project or in any of the other research that you can find out there and think, okay, we're circular already. No, that's not enough. Um, and back to the match project, what we're trying to do is to help organizations to, to be uh, very, very holistic and look with open eyes onto all eight dimensions of circular readiness. And I can tell you, we've really seen some fantastic um, aha uh, experiences from the companies where they've really had their eyes open to, okay, we need to put this and this and this element together. And, and maybe we've been focusing on the business model, but our organization is not ready. Or maybe the manufacturing has been looking at, at, at uh, closed cycles, but we've completely uh, uh, forgotten about the value chain opportunities. That's what we're trying to help with here. Thank you, Tim, for underlining that renting out some, some things doesn't necessarily make you completely green, but it's no. definitely a small step in the right direction. Um, that was the questions that we had time for today. Uh, thank you for all the questions. We have a few more that we will uh, reply to in writing. And thank you to you, uh, to Tim and Daniela for your presentations and, and providing all of these insights. Now, tomorrow we have two extra webinars uh, that we will dive into. That will be first technology and data, and then use support and maintenance. Tim, in short, how can data support a circular transition? Yes, um, it, it can do if we uh, use it properly. Uh, and I think that, that this one is about understanding um, where can we put sensors in our technology or which sensors do we have in our technology in order to 
be able to to monitor, to track, and to trace, and to understand the opportunities of uh, either lengthening the lifetime, uh, understanding when to maintain a product, understanding when to call it back, understanding what its condition is so that we can put it back out onto the market, and so on and so forth. So there's many opportunities there, and we're looking forward to sharing that with you tomorrow. Great. And Daniela, you are leading the, the presentation on use, support, and maintenance. What kinds of strategies does that, does that cover? Yeah, so we're going to be looking to what we can do to make our products last for as long as possible when they are at our customers by providing some additional services like, for example, repair and maintenance and how we can make that work both from a convenience point of view, a profitability point of view and a sustainability point of view. Thank you. I'm looking forward to both of them. That was all for today, guys. See you hopefully all tomorrow again. And feel free to share any relevant info in the chat. Thanks for today. Thanks for today. Bye.